A Lagrange point is a position in an orbital configuration of two large bodies where a small object affected only by gravity can maintain its position relative to the two large bodies. It's also a video game. Lagrange Point is a sci-fi role-playing game that was both developed and published by a bunch of pricks, and was released on the 26th of April of 1991 for the Famicom. It's a somewhat notorious game for a variety of reasons. One of them is the Game Workshop Project, which was established for issue 100 of the Family Computer magazine. The developers asked the magazine's readers for ideas to implement in their new game. This ranged from NPCs and their dialogue, to character and monster designs, and even music tracks. It's also the only game to take advantage of the sound capabilities of Konami's VRC7 chip. Developers adding special mapper chips to the cartridges wasn't too uncommon. The most notable advantage of these chips was in the sound department, although in the West we weren't able to enjoy that due to differences in the NES hardware. A very well-known example is Castlevania 3, which used the VRC6 chip. Us losers in America and Europe got this. Meanwhile in Japan... The VRC7 is the successor to the VRC6, boasting of even more fancy hardware. The chip itself was included in two games, Lagrange Point and Tiny Toon Adventures 2. While the weather didn't actually use the chip's sound capabilities, the developers of Lagrange Point took full advantage of it, resulting in a soundtrack different from any other game in the system. But technology isn't the only thing it has going for it. Lagrange Point's setting and themes make it stand out amongst other games of its era, although a JRPG set in a science fiction universe certainly isn't as unique in 1991 compared to a few years ago. Alongside it is the Fantasy Star series, which combines fantasy with science fiction, and Hoshio Miruhito, which combines crap with garbage. The game takes place in the 22nd century. At the Lagrange point, humanity built the Isis Cluster, a group of space colonies. However, some sort of biological catastrophe took place in one of them, and communication with the Isis Cluster was lost. You and your merry crew of Expendables are sent to investigate what happened. Things don't go very well. Robots attack your group, the shuttle blows up, and suddenly you're in a medical room. The injured captain entrusts you with finding Stolt, and thus you're now free to go on your merry way. Right away you'll notice that this game looks pretty nice considering the hardware it's stuck in. It's all very detailed and colorful. The maps, the menus, the shops... The battle screen is probably the weakest link, unless you really like those trippy lines on the sides. This isn't too surprising, however, since the game was released far into the Famicom's life. In fact, Sega's Mega Drive had already been on the market for nearly three years, and the Super Famicom had been for about half a year. Combined with the fancy music and the overall polish on the technical side of things, Lagrange Point almost feels like it's on a different system. Not to diss the classics like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, because things were obviously different back then, but Lagrange Point pushes the hardware to its limit. But of course, this would all go to waste if the gameplay wasn't up to par. Lagrange Point is, at its core, a standard turn-based RPG. You explore towns and dungeons, talk to people for information, acquire all sorts of items and fight enemies in turn-based battles. It does put a few spins on the usual mechanics, however. At the beginning, the protagonist is the only party member, but soon you'll start finding more people who will aid you in your quest. Aside from the protagonist, there are nine more party members to find, divided across three species – humans, cyborgs and robots. Your party is composed of four fighting members and up to two support members who come and go as the story progresses, although they don't do anything aside from occasionally talking during combat. Humans and cyborgs are practically identical. Each human character has a special super move they can use, 
while cyborgs don't. These super moves cost a percentage of the user's maximum HP in exchange for a powerful effect, such as dealing a fixed amount of damage to the enemies or stunning them for a couple of turns. Each party member also has up to 4 techs they can use. These are effective with the game's equivalent of magic spells, and casting them costs a certain amount of battery points, or BP for short. Characters don't learn them through level ups, however. You need to find the respective kits first, which then automatically grant the tech to the characters that can use it. Unfortunately, higher spell tiers overwrite the previous one, so, for example, once you acquire HP Restore 2, you can no longer use HP Restore 1. BP doesn't race through level ups either, you have to purchase upgrades for each individual party member. You want to do this because it's not just techs that use BP, your regular attacks also cost a certain amount of BP depending on the weapon. In addition to the usual sort of status effects such as paralysis, sweep and poison equivalents, characters can also be rendered unconscious. Taking a fatal blow in battle leaves the character with 1 HP and unable to act for the rest of the battle. If they take another hit, their HP drops to zero and the character is set to dying status, and can only recover at terminals found in cities. If they don't get hit again until the battle is over, they regain consciousness and can be healed normally and fight once more. Humans and cyborgs also have three extra status effects of sorts. If the battle is going well, they might get hyped, increasing their chances of dealing critical hits. If things get nasty, they might get nervous or start panicking. The former prevents them from using super moves and techs, while the latter renders them unable to do anything. Interestingly, the cheer tech not only grants the hype status to the target character, but also overrides the nervous and panic status. Robots are a bit more interesting. They don't get affected by the previous three statuses, but also can't be healed through regular healing and techs, instead requiring their own special items. Robots also have their own unique equipment. By using robot parts, their weapon upgrades step by step, cycling through progressively stronger single and multi-target attacks. They also only have a single armor piece to equip instead of four. Meanwhile, human and cyborg weapons feature one of the game's most interesting mechanics. A few hours into the story, you gain the ability to travel to the satellite base, which functions as a sort of hub area. It's here where you can freely swap characters in and out of your party. It's also here where you can do science. There are six weapon ranks and six elements. Combining two weapons of the same rank results in a new weapon of the rank above it, while combining the various elements results in a different weapon element. With these two factors, you have a very wide selection of weapons to pick from. But of course, you can't just make the strongest weapons and start coasting through the rest of the game right away. Not only does creating the higher ranked weapons cost too much at this point of the game, but they also have stat requirements. Naturally, stronger weapons also cost more BP to use. Unfortunately, the weapon combination doesn't seem to follow any understandable logic. A certain element combination will always produce the same resulting element, but the base weapons used don't make much sense. For example, if you combine two electric weapons, you'd expect to end up with an electric weapon, but uh, no. If you combine two knives, you'd expect to end up with some sort of bladed weapon, but no. The stat requirements could have been a bit lower too. At the same time you get access to the satellite base, you get tasked with grabbing three data disks from three areas. The problem is that there's a difficulty spike at this point, and the three areas have enemies that can cause you a lot of problems, even with the strongest equipment you can buy. Your best option is to fuse some stronger weapons and increase your damage output, but in my experience your party members won't have high enough stats to equip any significantly stronger weapons. Once you get past that bump, however, things get a lot easier. By the end of the game, random encounters will be trivial thanks to rank 6 weapons being ridiculously overpowered, so overpowered in fact that they make super moves useless. You won't be struggling with cash or recovery items either. Your party members' personalities also all have the depth of a puddle. 
The protagonist only speaks in battle, if that even counts, and has no real traits besides being member of the recon squad. The rest of the party members don't fare much better. They have a small introduction before joining the group, but after that they are pretty much never mentioned again. This is probably because they can be swapped out at will, so the developers would have to take every single party combination into account during dialogue. Still, it would be nice to have at least some more character development for some of these characters. To be fair though, most RPGs on the system aren't exactly known for having detailed stories and characters by today's standards, so I guess Lagrange Point isn't too far behind games like Final Fantasy II. I think that what also lets Lagrange Point down a bit for me is how the whole game feels somewhat underwhelming once you get past its technical shininess. I couldn't get infested in the plot after the first few hours because everything felt, I don't know, cheap? The two most developed characters in the game, which isn't saying much, don't show up again after a certain part. One of them is briefly mentioned again after a long while by an NPC, and that's probably the emotional high point of the second half of the game, not the deaths of several random NPCs you only knew for 20 seconds. Even the final boss has nothing of value to say or show. Also there's no space dolphins. While the soundtrack has some good stuff in it, the music you hear during most of your playtime, that is, the overworld, dungeon and battle themes, is usually not particularly great. I know how subjective this sounds, but I'd say that they lack the energy of emotion of other soundtracks on the Famicom. On that same note, even though there are dozens of dungeons to explore, most of them are quite short and have very simple layouts. In the end though, the game might be worth checking out if you're a fan of traditional JRPGs. While it remained a Japan exclusive, it got a complete fan translation a few years ago. Well, of course it did, you've been looking at it this entire video. It has its own tweaks and gimmicks that make it stand out from its competitors, even if the execution isn't perfect. And if nothing else, the music is worth checking out, even if just out of curiosity.